take the call. And what it was, it was a, another island, and it was the, uh, the police, they call them constables down in the islands. It was a, a police officer calling and saying, listen, we need you to come in here. We have an injured police officer. We need you. I had an airplane, a twin-engine airplane. We need you to come over here and pick him up. Well, I knew who he was. I knew Cedric. Cedric used to be a police officer on our island. And now he's over on an island called Rum Key. We lived in Deadman's Key. And he got injured on Rum Key. Now, back in the 80s, Rum Key didn't have an airport. They do now. If you look at the Bahamas and you go way out toward uh, uh, Africa, out in the ocean, you'll see on the outside uh, edge of the Bahama Islands, you'll see a little island called Rum Key. They didn't have an airport then. So they were going to block off a section of the road so that I could come in and land and pick him up. So they told me, they said, we've done this before, never with a twin engine airplane, single engine, but uh, what they always do when they come in to land, uh, they always come in and land toward the water, not away from the water, toward the water, and there's a grove of coconut palm trees right before you get to the water. Well, when they told me that, I've got a plan. I don't like that. I don't like the idea that once you set that airplane down on the ground, you can't get back out if you want to. Because if you're setting that airplane down, it's a twin engine, it lands fairly fast. It takes a little bit of time getting it slowed down, and I'm landing on a dirt road. Now, the dirt road is not a level dirt road. I don't know if y'all have ever been in a sandy area but in a sandy area, the dirt roads are rutted out and the, and the center of your car drags a little bit. It's so uh, wallowed out on the sides. Well, I didn't like the idea of landing, touching down, and headed toward those palm trees because what if I can't get stopped? Obviously, I'm going to hit a palm tree. So I'd already decided in my mind, my plan was this. I'm going to come in over the top of the palm trees, set down, and land the other direction. So that's what, exactly what I did. So I came in, land, I landed, I touched down in, on that little dirt road. And what I didn't realize is the reason why everybody always landed the other way because it's the wind, the prevailing wind. Well, I had a 25-knot tailwind. You shouldn't land with a tailwind because it will just push you and push you and push you. Well, I touched down and I went and I kept going and I kept going and I kept going, and I see them, they're in a grassy area off the side of the road. I went past them, they all waved at me. And I just kept going. And then, there's a portion of the road that's straight, that's the portion I landed on. But I just kept going, I couldn't get it stopped. And I went past that, went around the turn, there was a turn, I didn't even know what was around the corner. Fortunately, I finally got it stopped and there was another little clearing. I turned around and came back, pulled off into the grassy area and I could see where the police officer is laying in the back of a pickup truck and uh, I, get out of the, I get out of the airplane. They're all patting me on the back. They said, we've never seen that before. Man, you must really be something. Well, let me just tell you something. On the outside, I said, yeah, you know, if you got it, you got it. On the inside, I was scared to death because I said, I'm never doing that again. Next time I'll land toward the palm trees. But uh, anyway, so I looked over at Cedric. He's laying in the back of the truck. I said, Cedric, man, what happened? Was it, was it a drug bust or uh, was, was you trying to apprehend somebody and they shot you in the leg? Because I, I could see his leg was all bandaged up. He said, no. He said, I was playing softball and I rounded second base and I broke my leg going around second base. I said, you mean I came over here because, because you broke your leg playing softball? He said, yeah, but... He said, and every island has a boat that comes in once a week. He said, the boat doesn't come in for a whole week. I, I need you to take me to the hospital. So uh, we take off. We're headed toward Nassau, which most people know where Nassau is. Uh, it's about two hours from where we're at. Excuse me, about an hour and a half from where we're at. We take off. And by the way, when I took off, I, I took off the right direction that time. And so uh, we get airborne. And when you are flying somebody like that, you change your call sign. So my, normally my plane would be November 5, 9, or 6, 4 Yankee. 
but when you've got a patient on board, you refer to them, at, you refer to your aircraft, and when you call up Nassau Center or Miami Center, you refer to yourself as lifeguard because you have a patient on board, you're a medvac. So you, you pronounce, you give yourself lifeguard, so now it's lifeguard 5-9 or 6-4 Yankee, and what that does, that lets the controllers know you have a patient on board and it could be serious, so they need to give you preferential treatment. So we get airborne, and I thought, well, I can use all the preferential treatment I, I, I could get. So I called, and I told them, I said, this is lifeguard 5 9 or 6 4 Yankee. Well, right off the bat, they know I got a patient. So they asked me the nature of the patient, and I, so I said, he's a Royal Bahamian police officer. He's been injured. I didn't say anything about the softball accident. I said he's been injured. I'm telling you, all the tourists that were coming into Nassau that day on Delta and Southwest and United and Continental, they had the circle out there and wait on me because they gave me preferential treatment. And when I landed, they had an ambulance there waiting for him, but then they had a police escort. This thing got bigger than what I intended it to be. It just got bigger and bigger. And I didn't, st I'll just be honest with you, I didn't stay around long enough to explain to them it was a softball accident. I got out of there. But sometimes things that you plan just don't go the way that you want them to go. And so you, you just have to adjust and readjust sometimes. But the great thing is, you know, God knows everything that's going on. He's still in control regardless. Sometimes we feel like we've lost control. But He is, in, he is still in control and uh, He wants us to always, always represent Him. And so with that in mind this morning, would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. <clears throat> the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Here in Matthew, chapter 5, we're going to begin, uh, we're going to start in verse 38. In Matthew, chapter 5, this is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there's some things that are involved in this. We're just going to look at one. But when you read this, sometimes you go over it so hurriedly, you need to read it within the context of what is taking place in the area at the time and in the culture at the time. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Would you look with me in verse 38? This is Jesus preaching. He says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. In other words, wait a minute. He is, he is referring to the law, and then he's referring to grace. He said under the law, it was different. He said, but I'm saying now, you turn the other cheek. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not good at turning the other cheek. Uh, we drove from, this morning, we drove from McDonough, Georgia, the south side of Atlanta, up here. And the closer we got to here, the crazier the drivers got on the interstate. I'm not good at turning the other cheek. That's all I'm saying. I'm just being honest with you. Verse 40, he says, And if any man, uh, if any man will sue thee at, at the law take away thy co and, and, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile... Go with him twain, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. Now I want us to look at uh, verse 41. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Now there's a, there's a story behind this. I want you to stay with me on this now. There's a story behind it. So here we have what is known as the Sermon on the Mount by the Lord. And the Lord is uh, he, he's preaching and that day, they were all these, what he was saying, all of them were convicting. But this one about, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Whoever compels you to go with you one mile, go with him two. This is the one that rankled the most. Now, let me explain to you why. Uh, in that time period, uh, the Jews were under submission to the Roman Empire. And they hated it. They didn't like it. The Romans were ruling them. I mean, at one time, uh, the, 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 in the Jewish culture and in Jerusalem, uh, David was king and it, and it was a powerful nation. But now they find themselves 
under the rule of the Roman Empire, and they didn't like it at all. And Rome had a, had a law. They had soldiers, the Roman soldiers, I mean, they were the mightiest army of this day. No one was more powerful than the Roman Empire. And so there was a law that stated this. If a Roman soldier approached you traveling with a pack and he stopped you and said for you to carry his pack, by the law, you had to carry his pack for one mile. Now when we came up this morning, the GPS told us what mile marker to get off the interstate. We didn't come up with that idea of mile markers. The Roman Empire did. So when they compelled a Jew to carry their pack as a Roman soldier, it was the law. If a Roman soldier asked you, well, if he ordered you to carry his pack and everything he had, you were bound by the law to carry it at least one mile, and there were mile markers on the Roman roads. So there's no way you can say, well, I think we've gone a mile. No, there's a mile marker. And they know exactly where it's at. And so here Jesus is preaching, and He's preaching this message, and all of a sudden He says, if someone compels you to go a mile, you go the second mile. You go beyond what the law says. You go beyond what's expected of you. Now, let's put it into relationship of, of, of what that means to us. Think with me now. Let's say that we have two Jews. They're both born-again believers. They're both working out in their fields. Here comes a Roman soldier. The Roman soldier comes up to the first Jew. He says, carry my pack. So by the law, he has to quit working in his field, walk over, pick up the soldier's pack, and start walking, carrying the pack for the soldier. He knows it's the law. He has to go one mile. The entire time, now remember, he's a born-again Christian. The entire mile that he's carrying it, he is so infuriated. He's got so much work to do. This crazy law that says he has to carry it. And he's mumbling and complaining the entire time. And he just can't believe he's got to do this. He's got to stop his work. And he's lost all track of why he is there. Because what happens to us as born-again believers, every once in a while we forget what our purpose is. And sometimes we forget what the main thing is. And we need to always keep the main thing the main thing. And that is telling men and women and boys and girls about the gospel of Jesus Christ in order that they can trust Christ as their personal Savior. So this particular Jew, all he's thinking about is this crazy law. And he's complaining and he's murmuring and he's lost track of what the main thing is. He gets to the one mile or gets to the mile marker that states that he's already carried, a mile, uh, carried it a mile. He drops it at the feet of the Roman soldier. He has obeyed the law. He stomps off in the opposite direction. And he's lost all track of what his purpose is. He has not one time shared the gospel with this Roman soldier. By the way, when he dropped the pack and turned to the Roman soldier and began to share with him the gospel, do you think that Roman soldier is going to listen to him? Absolutely not. For the whole last mile, he's heard him complain and murmur and gripe. Nothing. He has no desire because that Jew has nothing, even though he's a born-again believer, that Jew has nothing that that Roman soldier wants. That's why we need to be so careful about how we conduct ourselves because if we say we have the gospel, we have forgiveness of sins. We have Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. We're no longer a slave to sin. We have been freed by Jesus Christ as a born-again believer. And we tell people that there ought to be something different about us than the world. We ought to have a smile on our face. We ought to look different. We ought to talk different. We ought to go to different places. There ought to be something different about us. Now they'll say there's their second Jew working over in the field. He has a compassion for lost souls. He sees this Roman soldier motioning for him to come over there. 
He comes over and this soldier, all the soldiers knew the Jews hated this law. He says, carry my pack. He picks the pack up and they start walking. He's not complaining because the whole time he's thinking, i got to tell this guy. I may never get another opportunity to share the gospel with him. And besides, if he trusts Christ, the Roman soldiers went all over the world. Imagine what this Roman soldier could do with the gospel. And so he begins to, I'm sure, he begins to tell him about the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Remember, they don't have the New Testament scriptures. They got the Old Testament. And so he begins to tell him about what the law demanded, but then he begins to tell him about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done. And I'm, just imagine with me now, so they're walking, and this Roman soldier, he's not listening to much of it. But after the first mile marker passes, this Jew hasn't set down the pack. He's still talking about Jesus Christ. He's still talking about the Messiah. And he's gone past the first mile marker. And now imagine this Roman soldier, he knows how bad these Jews hate this law. This, this Jew hasn't murmured, hasn't complained one time, hasn't criticized the law one time. In fact, he is so, he is so uh, focused on this Jesus Christ and this thing about the gospel, he didn't even pay attention to the mile marker. And I can tell you one thing about this Roman soldier. Now he's listening. Before he only heard, but now he is listening because he's interested this Jew is different from all the other ones that he's made carry his pack. This one is different. Not only did he obey the law, now he's gone beyond obeying the law and he's carrying his pack and he's gone further and further and further away from his job, from his work, and he's gone further. And all because this Roman soldier begins to realize this thing about the gospel is real serious with this guy. And he begins to listen. Now, which one of the two Jews do you think is going to be able to lead the Roman soldier to Christ? It's not going to be that first one. It's going to be that second one. That's what Jesus is preaching here. He's talking about when you're compelled to go a mile because of who we are in Christ, go beyond that. Go the second mile. And so he, he, he definitely shows us that there is a difference between a second mile Christian I want to give you just a few things here this morning about what makes a second mile Christian different. First of all, and I'll just give you these passages of Scripture. Over in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 31, we find that the second mile Christians are constantly aware of the presence of Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6 gives us this. He says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God... He it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Let me give you a passage out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Second mile Christians always seem to be aware of the presence of God in their lives. And I'm not talking about at church Obviously, he's here, but I'm talking about on the job, in school, wherever their lives lead them. They are constantly aware of God's presence. As a young teenage boy, my dad was a preacher. I am now 16 years old, getting ready to turn 17 a little later on, and I have not trusted Christ. Everybody thought I was saved, but in my heart, I knew I wasn't. And I was a very rebellious 16-year-old teenager. I was a teenager that my parents did not know what to do with me. But I had a Sunday school teacher by the name of Lee Landris. I can use his name because Lee Landris has already passed on. He's already gone to heaven. Lee Landris did not sing in the choir. Uh, he didn't sing specials. He never preached. But he taught a teenage boy Sunday school class. And... Uh, so I sat in his class every Sunday. I wouldn't have gone to church, but my mom and dad made me go to church. My dad's a preacher, so I kind of had to go to church. He's not the pastor of that church, but he's, the pre he's, he's a preacher. And so I didn't have a choice. I had to go to church. And I had to sit in Lee Landris' Sunday school class every Sunday morning. So here I am, a lost teenage boy, 
sitting in Lee Landris Sunday school class. Lee Landris was a contractor. Now these men in here will know what I'm talking about. Lee Landris was a man's man. He was tough. His fingers, his fingers were as big around as they were long. You know what I mean? You wouldn't want Lee Landris to ever slap you because you would wake up two months from the day he slapped you. I'm just saying he was tough as nails. I found out one summer that Lee Landris was going to hire some workers. And uh, he's only going to hire a couple. So I went to him one Sunday morning after Sunday school. I said, Mr. Landris, I, I, I'd like an opportunity to like, try to work, work with you if, if you're still hiring. Because Lee Landris was paying $2.85 an hour. Now, before you say, why would you work for that cheap? We're talk I'm old as dirt, so we're talking a long time ago. Gas was 23 cents a gallon when I went to work for Lee Landers. So making $2.85 an hour, I was going to retire by the end of the summer. I mean, I was going to draw in the money. And so uh, I worked for Lee Landers, and it was hard work. We're talking about South Miami. It's always hot in South Miami. And uh, worked on job sites. One thing about Lee Landris, he was the same in the Sunday school class as he was on the job site. Now, if any of you have ever worked on a construction site, you're liable to hear anything as what people say. But not on a job site with Lee Landris. I've seen this several times. One day we had, this is before I'd ever seen it, I worked uh, Lee Landers had another man that worked for him by the name of John. John was not saved. John told me one day, even when I wasn't saved, he told me one day, we were sitting in the truck, John said, tell you what, if I ever get saved, it'll be because of Lee Landers. He said, I've known Lee Landers before Lee Landers got saved. I know what he used to be like. And if I ever get saved, it'll be because of Lee Landers because he's the real deal. Well, he's my Sunday school teacher. And so I'm on the job. And I felt more comfortable with John because John wasn't saved. And he was a lot older man. He wasn't saved. But I felt more comfortable with him because I wasn't saved. Lee Landris made me feel uncomfortable. So we're on the job site one day. We're getting ready to have uh, the roofing done on this house we're building. And Lee Landris subcontracted it out. Four or five pickup trucks pull into the to the driveway all at once and these guys started getting out and it wasn't long before I heard a curse word and I knew what was going to happen I heard one of them say something and then I heard Lee Landers hey who said that let me tell you something on my job sites we do not take the Lord's name in vain you just, you just took the name of my Savior in vain we're not going to have that well, if any of you have ever worked on job sites, roofers are, roofers are tough guys, I'm just saying. And about six of them encircled Lee Landris. He's standing in the middle. And I said to John, I said, they're going to beat the daylights out of him. We, we need to step in there and do what we can do to help him. He goes, no, 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 just watch this. I've seen this before. So here's Lee Landris. He said, now boys, I'm going to tell you something. I've, you've signed a contract that you're going to put the roof on this house. In a little bit, I'm going to carry each of you to the emergency room because you're going to need some help. I'm going to carry you to the emergency room and when they get done putting you back together, I'm going to drive you back over here and you're going to put that roof on because you've signed a contract. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to use the name, name of the, my Lord in vain. Now before, before we get into this, Here's what I want to tell you. And he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a New Testament. And he starts down the Romans road. And by the time he got to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The fight was gone out of them. They didn't want to fight him. They wanted to get away from him. Though I have seen, and I'd seen it since then, I've seen one or two of them go to him afterwards and say, listen, can you tell me some more about that? Can you, can you just tell me... This thing about being saved, can you tell me how to do that? But on that day, I watched the fight go out of all of them. And finally they said, we need to get the roof on. And they just walked away, started up the ladders, getting the equipment up, and they put the roof on that day. Let me tell you what I saw that day. 
I saw a second mile Christian that understood what it meant to have the presence of God in their life. And he wasn't about to let anybody in the presence of God take the Lord's name in vain. Second mile Christians are constantly aware of the presence of God in their lives. Let me give you a second one. Second mile Christians are constantly aware of others. Let me give you a passage of scripture real quick. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us this, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward His name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. For the second mile Christian, others are constantly on their minds. Everything is a means to an end of serving others. You ever meet those type of people? I've been in various churches down through the years. I've been in the ministry 40 years. There's two types of people that come to church other than saved and unsaved, and they're this. There's people who come to church that say, what are y'all going to do for me? What's in this for me? And then there's others that come to church that have this attitude. What can I do to be a blessing to someone else? How can I serve you? What is it that I can do for you? I, I looked for years for this poem. I've heard this poem before, and I found it the other day, and I love it. It's an old one that's been quoted over and over and over again. I'm so old, my memory is bad, so I can't quote it, so i got to read it for you. Listen to this. Lord, help me to live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I'll do for you must needs be done for others. Let self be crucified and, and slain and buried deep and all in vain may efforts be to rise again and less to live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven has begun, may I forget the crown I've won while thinking still of others. Others, Lord, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like Thee. Second mile Christians are constantly aware of others, serving others. They're the ones who operate in the background that nobody really knows about. We have a man like that at our church down in McDonough, Georgia. I'm not going to give you his name because he's still living. And for his privacy, I won't do that. This man is probably a millionaire, though you wouldn't know it. He's a hard worker. We did some work at our church. As you approach our church from the, from the north side of Mill Road, there was this big hill. And you couldn't see the church till all of a sudden he was right at the entrance. He got, he got permission from the county to shave that hill down. So he and I, I can operate a tractor, and he does too. So he brought the tractor, and uh, the church had a tractor. So we, for weeks, mowed that hill down. He never said a word to anybody. He never, he, he told the pastor, don't, don't thank me from the pulpit. I, I don't need thanks, just being able to serve the church. Because this man, he's never sang in the choir, never taught a Sunday school class, never preached a message. I mean, this is what he does. This is his way of serving God. And it's been on numerous occasions in his suit after a Sunday morning, he, go out, he goes out to where our dumpsters sit, and if, you know, if you've ever been around a dumpster, you know, either people throwing stuff in miss sometimes or the truck dumping it in the, picking up the dumpster and dumping it in the back of the truck, sometimes stuff comes out. And he's out there, nobody knows. He's in the background always working. He's out there in his Sunday suit picking up garbage that didn't make it into the truck, putting it back in the dumpster, always working in the background. Second mile Christians are always thinking about others. They never think about themselves. They never put themselves first. Let me give you a third one very quickly here. Second mile Christians are compassionately aware of eternity. Let me give you a passage real quick. Romans chapter 9 verse 3, For I wish, for I could, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. This is Paul speaking. He says, I wish that I could take on the curse of, of, of my kinsmen, of the Jewish people, that they would, in order that they could go to heaven, in order that they could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, if I could take that on for them, I would do it. Second mile Christians, they're always aware of eternity because they realize 
that eternity is too, wrong, too long to be wrong about heaven. Heaven is a real literal place just like Atlanta, Georgia is a real literal place. And the Bible has a lot to say about heaven. I'll give you a passage here real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3. But uh, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. The Bible says that you're not capable of if even imagining what God has prepared for you in heaven. Heaven is a real, literal place. And one thing I know about Second Mile Christians is this. They are fully aware that heaven, that eternity is too long to be wrong about heaven. But they are also very aware that eternity is too long to be wrong about hell. Just as heaven is a real, literal place, hell is a real, literal place. Jesus preached more about hell than He did heaven. Hell is a real, literal place. And those that are without Christ, that is their eternal damnation. That is their eternal place. A lot of people think, well, as long as I go to church, as long as I get baptized, as long as I try to be good, do good, as long as I put money in the offering plate to be the best that I can, and I'm sincere, I get to go to heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll never see heaven. And you'll be doomed to this real, literal place called hell for all eternity. One thing I do know about Second Mile Christians is they realize that eternity is too long to be wrong about hell. I want to give you this story and I'm going to be done. I read this uh, and it's a great illustration of what I'm trying to get across to you this morning. There was this man by the name of Mr. Turnbuckle. He edited medical journal, journals for a publishing company. Now, first of all, you've got to be a brain to do that. He edited medical journals. Now, I've read medical journals, and I'm telling you, they're boring. They are so boring. If you can't sleep, you read a medical journal, you'll go to sleep. That's how bad it is. And he edited medical journals for a living. He was always the first one at work on a Monday morning and the last one to leave on Friday evening. He never spoke to anyone, so no one ever spoke to him. He never attended any of the Thanksgiving or Christmas office parties. Everybody wondered if Mr. Turnbuckle had a family or even a single friend, but they never asked. It had been a long week. It's now Friday. And everybody knows that Mr. Turnbuckle is the last one to leave on Fridays. All he has is his job and nothing else. He is sitting at his desk, still looking at the medical journal. The cleaning lady came in that evening. She tidied up the office and so she saw Mr. Turnbuckle sitting at his desk and she didn't want to disturb him so she finished cleaning up. She started to leave and then she thought, well maybe I should at least let him know that I'm leaving so he'll know that I'm going to lock the door on the way out and then he can leave. She goes over to Mr. Turnbuckle and she calls his name. He doesn't respond. She gets closer and calls his name again. He doesn't respond. She goes over where she can make eye contact and he doesn't respond and she realizes that he's dead. Sitting at his desk on a Friday evening looking at the medical journal. So she calls the police, the police come, the coroner comes, and the coroner is there working on him because they're trying to figure out what in the world happened. And so the coroner tells the police officer, says, well, I don't know how to explain this, but Mr. Turnbuckle had a massive heart attack, so massive that it left him sitting here staring at the medical journal. And the police officer was rather stunned at that, he says, no, 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 it's worse than that. Mr. Turnbuckle died sometime right after getting to work. The police officer said, you mean he's been sitting here staring at this book all day long and everybody passing his desk did not realize that he was dead? What kind of people are, are these? Well, I can tell you one thing, they're not second mile Christians. No one ever said a word to him, Mr. Turnbuckle. No one, no one ever 
ever stopped and said, hey, what are you doing for lunch today? Would you like to go get lunch? No one talked to him. He didn't talk to them. The coroner says, no, it's worse than that. When I say he died after he got to work, I don't mean this morning. Today is Friday. I mean he died after coming to work on Monday morning. He had been sitting dead at his desk for an entire week and no one even knew it and no one cared. You know, it takes a second mile Christian to be aware of others. You know, I want to be a second mile Christian. I don't want to go through life not seeing people. That's what it's all about. That's the reason why, that's our purpose. To share the gospel with others. I want others to have what I've got. By the way, what I've got is not religion. Religion won't help you one single bit. In your hour of need, at your darkest hour of need, religion won't help you one single bit. Religion is a list of rules, man-made rules, and rituals and traditions that you follow them, but no one can tell you at what point, at what line that you cross, that you've gone far enough to be good enough to be accepted of God. What I have is not religion. What I have is a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for my sins. And there was a day that occurred in my life where I prayed. I said, Dear Lord, the best way I know how, I'm asking you to be my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross. You shed your blood. You gave everything for me to pay my sin debt. And I accept that payment for my sins. I want you to come into my life and have full control. And that day I got saved. I didn't know all the verbiage. I didn't know all the exact things I should have said or might have said. But I know this, I trusted Christ as my Savior that day. And God churned, changed my life and turned my life around. I went from being a rebellious teenager that hated going to church to being a teenager I couldn't wait to get to church. I'm just saying a second mile Christian is different from all the other Christians. And I want to be a second mile Christian. I pray that God will help me to be a second mile Christian. Let me ask you this morning, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, are you a second mile Christian? Would you go the second mile for someone in order to share the gospel with them? Would you, would you think of others so much beyond yourself where you would not blindly just look the other way? Can you see them? Can you see them on the sidewalks? Can you see them as you pass them on the road? Can you see them as you're in the grocery store? Can you see them on your job, in your neighborhood? Can you see other people? Because that's what we're still here for. Other than that, the moment I, we trusted Christ, we'd be gone. I believe the Lord is looking for some second-mile Christians to use. I want Him to use me. I, I want the Lord to know that He can count on me. Can He count on you this morning? Would you stand with me with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a few moments? You may be here this morning. You've never trusted Christ. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you it's the greatest thing in the world? It's not religion. You've already heard me say that. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. This morning, you're interested in it. This morning, you say, Brother Saunders, I tell you, I, I, I may be saved. I don't know. But I'd like to know for sure. And you say, Brother Saunders, would you pray for me? I, I'm, by the way, I'm not going to come back and bother you. I'm not going to recognize you raising your hand. I'm simply going to do as I promised. I'm going to pray for you. I don't know any of your names, but I'll know your face, and I'll keep you in my prayers. Brother Saunders, I do not know Christ, or I don't know 100% for sure that I know Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up and put it right back down? Anyone? Well, that tells me, God bless you. That tells me that most everybody here then are Christians. Let me ask you this. Are you a second mile Christian? Are you a second mile Christian? You may be here this morning You say, Brother Saunders, I want to be a second mile Christian. There's times I am, there's times I'm not, but I want to be. And I'd love for the Lord to help me. 
they're going to play an invitation song. And as they play this song, you say, Brother Saunders, I'd love to come to the altar and pray and ask God to help me to be a second mile Christian. As they begin to play an invitation hymn, I want you to feel free to come as she plays right now. If you're here this morning, would you come this morning? Brother Saunders, I want to be a second mile Christian. I don't want to be, I just don't want to be following the law. I want to move beyond that. I want to be different.